Well, it's a great pleasure <clears throat> to be with you this evening. Uh, one of the, the great delights of being a Reformation person is that October is always a, a great month for extra employment. Uh, I can be safely ignored for the other 11 months of the year, but in October uh, I find myself with an embarrassment of riches as far as speaking engagements comes. And so it's a great delight to be with you this evening and to have an opportunity to open God's Word to you, particularly in the context of emphases and interests of Reformation theology. And the title for the sermon this evening, as you'll see from your programs, is Prayer, a Means of Reformation, a Means of Grace. I can dispatch the means of reformation relatively quickly. I think anybody who knows anything about the Reformation knows how central prayer was to the movements that swept Europe in the 16th and the 17th centuries. One only has to look at the literary productions of the Reformation to understand the centrality of prayer. Among the great achievements, I think, of English literary prose is the Book of Common Prayer. The Book of Common Prayer was written by Thomas Cranmer in order to place into the hands of ordinary men and women forms of words that would allow them to come into the presence of God and to speak to him appropriately. In 1525, Luther produced the first full German liturgy. Interestingly enough, he had called for a German liturgy in 1520, but as a sensitive pastor, he did not push for a German liturgy until 1525. It took him five years to get there, and I think the reason for that was he wanted to bring people on slowly, but he knew that it was important. And if you look at his liturgy of 1525, you will be struck at the importance and the centrality of prayer to what he has to say. One of the most touching moments uh, in Luther's career, a man who was capable at times of great anger and great hatred, one of the most touching moments though was when his hairdresser, Peter the Barber, and Luther's hair I think was tending like mine towards middle age, so his barber probably didn't have too much work to do with his hair, but at some point while he was cutting Luther's hair he confessed to Luther, his pastor, that he couldn't pray. He'd lost the ability to pray. And Luther, the most infamous, certainly one of the most busy, most important men in Europe at the time, went home and wrote a treatise on prayer for his hairdresser. And then when we come to English Puritanism, Westminster Assembly of the 1640s put together a directory of public worship and so concerned were these anti-liturgical Puritans that the church would not be led properly in prayer that the directory of public worship contained a number of model prayers. So the evidence for the importance of prayer as a means of reformation is there for everyone to see. What I really want to address tonight though is prayer as a means of grace. The Westminster Assembly produced the Directory of Public Worship and it also produced a couple of catechisms. And there is one of the questions and answers in the Shorter Catechism that has always puzzled me. And I will read it to you this evening and then try to show how I think the passages that have been read this evening, uh, the prayers that we've sung, can give a resolution to the problem that this throws our way. Question 88 of the Shorter Catechism says this, what are the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption? And the answer comes, the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption are his ordinances, especially the word, sacraments, and prayer, all which are made effectual to the elect for salvation. What is it that's puzzling and peculiar about that statement? Well, it is this. I think I'm very comfortable with the idea of word and sacrament being means of grace. The word comes from God to us. It brings the good news, the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ to us. It comes from God. The action, if you like, is from heaven towards earth. The same with baptism and the Lord's Supper. God is the agent in baptism 
and the Lord's Supper. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are not things, strictly speaking, that we do. They're things that God gives to us as acts of his grace. But prayer, how can prayer be a means of grace? Surely prayer is not our, is not God's act. It is our act. Is prayer not a response to God's grace rather than a means of grace? Do we not pray because of what God has done for us? Now to step back for a second, one would say that if you look at the New Testament, perhaps nothing is to characterize the Christian life more than prayer. Colossians 4 verse 2 says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Notice what Paul says there, we're to continue steadfastly in prayer. It's to be a continual characteristic of the Christian life and it's to be marked by thanksgiving. It's a response, if you like, to that which God has done for us in Christ. So I ask again, how can prayer be a means of grace? Nobody loves the Puritans more than I do, but have my heroes, if you like, let me down at this point. Did they get it wrong? Have they overplayed their hand? Well, I want to suggest to you this evening, there are two ways that prayer can be a means of grace. And I trust they will be an encouragement to you. Because there's nothing so characterizes the Christian life as prayer. Surely there is nothing we so neglect as prayer. And nothing we find harder than praying. And I want to suggest there are two ways that prayer is a means of grace. That prayer is something that God works in and through to advance his kingdom. First of all, I want to suggest that the foundation of prayer is the gracious act of the Trinitarian God in Christ as he himself prays to our Father. And I want to suggest, secondly, that prayer is the ordinary means of furthering God's work in ourselves, in the church, and in the wider world. Just those two basic points. First of all then, the foundation of prayer in the gracious act of the Trinitarian God in Christ as he himself prays to the Father. The general context of Christ's prayer, of course, is what we call the priesthood of Christ. And what we've just read from the Gospel of John, what Jonathan read so clearly to us, is often referred to as Christ's high priestly prayer. Christ's priesthood, the great offering that he is to make of himself to the Father on the cross, is reaching its climax. He's in the upper room with his disciples and he prays to God his Father. And it is surely one of the most profound and mysterious passages of Scripture. That prayer reveals the dynamic that lies behind Christ's ministry. Christ emerges there as the one who is sent by the Father, the one who is empowered by the Holy Spirit. We learn there that God is a community of persons. Sometimes students in my ancient church class will say, well, what do we lose if we lose the Trinity? Well, the first thing you lose is you can't make sense of something like John chapter 17 where Christ talks to his Father as a son talks to his Father. But there's something even more striking, I think, about John chapter 17 than even the fact that God is revealed here as a community of persons. We're reminded, we're taken, if you like, to the center of Christ's priesthood, and we are shown that the priesthood of Christ, the accomplishment of salvation itself, is in part an act involving the prayer of God himself. Prayer is an important part of Christ's earthly ministry. Hebrews 5 verse 7 tells us, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. In the days of his flesh, prayer is vital to the furthering of Christ's work relative to our salvation and his relationship to the Father. Prayer is part of Christ's obedience. Hebrews 5 verse 8 says, Although he was a son, 
He learned obedience through what he suffered. And prayer connects to that suffering. If you have your Bibles before you, turn with me to Luke chapter 21. Another profound insight, it seems to me, into the very inner workings of God himself in salvation. Sorry, it's not uh, Luke chapter 21. It's uh, Luke chapter 22. There's a lesson there that one should never add verses to one's sermons seconds before one gets into the pulpit, I guess. Luke chapter 22, verse 41. Another climactic moment in Christ's work as our Savior. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then it's the following mysterious verses that I find so striking here. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. What does that mean? The very Son of God being strengthened at this point by an angel. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I don't profess to be able to even scrape the surface of what that verse means. But I would say, you, know, you can go to a theater, you can go and see a play. My, my wife and I went to see some 15 years ago, we went to see a streetcar named Desire uh, in London. It's a powerful play. It may be the most powerful play uh, in recent American culture, I don't know. But you sit in the audience and we watched uh, Jessica Lange as, as Blanche Dubois, and it's powerful. You can watch the Marlon Brando movie and it's, not, it's powerful, but it's not as powerful as being there in the theater and seeing Jessica Lange portraying this woman slowly disintegrating before your eyes. And yet when the curtain came down, we all know that Jessica Lange goes home, goes back to her husband and she probably has a glass of wine and, and goes to bed and it was just a play. It was powerful, but it was just a play. This is not a play. I don't profess to be able to tell you all that's going on in this verse, but Christ is in agony here. His prayer arises out of his agony. Prayer is a vital part of Christ's ministry. Think of how often in the gospel accounts we're told that he withdraws to pray. Sometimes think, wow, if, if the very Son of God has to withdraw so frequently to pray, what a condemnation that is of our prayer lives those of us who are not the very sons of God in our being, how often do we withdraw to pray, to express our dependence upon our Heavenly Father? And we should also remember, of course, that as this prayer lies at the heart of Christ's ministry, it lies at the heart of his relationship with the Father. If you read the book of Hebrews, you'll see that Christ's work goes on. Often we think of Christ on the cross and he dies and he rises and it's done and there's a sense in which, yes, the decisive blow against the powers of evil has been dealt at that point. But Hebrews teaches us that Christ continues to intercede with us before, or continues to intercede on our behalf before the Father. Think about that. There are ways, uh, many ways of, of misconstruing that, and one of the most popular, I think, is this. One often hears the relationship between the Father and the Son construed uh, in terms like this, that the Father is somehow not convinced that people should be brought back into a right relationship with him. And so the son sits at his right hand and pleads with his father that his father will show mercy towards those that the son wishes the father to show mercy to. We've already this evening recited something that puts that view to the sword. We recited the Nicene Creed. We recited there the fact that Christ is of one being with the father. That that has profound implications, profound pra practical implications for understanding Christ's intercession on our behalf. Christ does not ask for anything from his Father that it is not the Father's, de Father's deepest desire to grant him. There is no opposition between the Father and the Son in the intercession of the Son. It is not akin 
to one of your children coming to you and interceding on behalf of one of his siblings. Yes, I know he threw the ball through the window, Dad, after you told him not to, but he's not a bad sort, really. Don't knock it off his Christmas list. And your heart melts and you think, well, it's just a window. It's not like that at all. When the son prays to the father, he asks the father for nothing that the father does not desire to grant him. That is what makes Christ's prayer so powerful. Christ's prayerful priesthood places the unified compassion of God as Trinity at the center of salvation. Yes, Christ is humbled voluntarily before his Father. But the Father listens to his prayers and desires to grant him all that he asks. And so one of the reasons why prayer is a means of grace is this. Prayer is a means of grace because the greatest prayer of all is that of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is God's chosen means, part of God's chosen means for bringing his grace and mercy to bear. And isn't it a delight that God has placed such an intermediary to stand and to plead on our behalf? We all like intermediaries. Heard recently my, my little sister, her daughter, who's about 20, was uh, working in a, in a dog kennels and uh, a gentleman came in and asked uh, if she would go on a date with his son. Uh, and she could see his son standing out by the father's car. Uh, and what, what man among us hasn't, can't sympathize with that when you know you're punching above your weight to ask a girl out on a date? Who would not want somebody to go and pop the question for you? My niece, just to give you, if you're interested, my niece said she would never go out with anybody who hadn't got the backbone to ask her herself. <laughs> but thankfully, God is far more merciful and gracious than my niece. God, that was, not, that was not meant as a joke, actually, but feel free to laugh. That was, a, that was a serious doctrinal point. God knowing our weaknesses, God being transcendent and holy, God being an awesome and terrifying God, and we being finite and sinful, God in his mercy, has placed an intermediary between us and him who will plead on our behalf and will ask God the Father simply for what God the Father already desires to give us. Hebrews 4.14, doesn't it put it beautifully? What comfort this should be to us. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you feel weak? Do you feel weak in the flesh? Do your prayers feel weak and ineffective? Do you stumble for the words to say are the times when you try to pray and you don't even know what words to say? We have a God who knows that. We have a God who has set a mediator for us. God the Son, a God who sympathizes for us because he is human. A God who has himself taken flesh so that we do not have to fear that he does not understand our weakness. Christ has entered the holy place. He sits before God interceding for us. And his intercession for us at this very moment makes our weak and imperfect and stumbling and inarticulate intercessions perfect and acceptable in his sight because they go through him who is perfect and acceptable in the sight of his Father. I might say perhaps... Christ's intercession is not so much the basis of our access to the Father. It is the way, the path, the means of our access to the Father. So the first thing then to say about prayer as a means of grace, prayer is a means of grace because our prayers are underwritten by the great prayer 
the great prayer of God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was God but who was also man, and who even now lives and sits at God's right hand and intercedes for us. Secondly, though, I want to suggest this evening that Christ's prayer is the foundation for the prayers of the church. Every great thing that has ever happened in the church, prayer has been part of it. Prayers are instrumental in the extension of God's kingdom. Note in Paul's letters how often he prays for others and how often he asks for the same for himself. Why does he do this? Well, an act of prayer, of course, reflects a knowledge of dependence. A request for prayer represents precisely the same. Sometimes we criticize Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox for saying, you know, they believe in the intercession of the saints. Well, we believe in the intercession of the saints too. We ask others to pray on our behalf. Amen. Even though we have direct access through Christ, why do we ask others to pray on our behalf? Because we're all part of one body, are we not? Identified with Christ by faith, the life of each individual is absorbed in some way in the life of the whole. And prayers that you make on my behalf are effective for my growth in grace and for my spiritual maturity, as my prayers will be effective for you. One of the striking things about prayer, one of the wonderful things about prayer is surely this. Paul often in his letters will talk about the diversity within the body of Christ. There are, sometimes he will use images, there are ears and there are eyes and there are hands and there are feet. And the hand shouldn't try to do the task that the foot does. And the eye shouldn't think it's worthless. Uh, the ear shouldn't think it's worthless because it isn't an eye. This kind of thing. There's a great diversity. We all have a diversity of gifts within the church. We've sung this evening in one of the hymns about the gifts that exist within the church. But one of the gifts that every Christian has is prayer. Every Christian should pray. Paul never says, those with the gifts of prayer should pray and those who don't should do something else. Prayer is universal. In Colossians, having laid out specific instructions for uh, uh, fathers and uh, children, for masters and bond servants, uh, for husbands and wives, Paul then goes on to urge everyone to pray. He makes no distinction. Prayer is a means, Paul clearly sees, of accomplishing the church's purpose. Sometimes we ask the question, well, if God is sovereign, why pray? Think about maybe as a Reformation question. Everybody knows that Calvin is the great theologian of predestination. Well, actually, of course, Calvin was not the great theologian of predestination. There were lots of great theologians of that doctrine before Calvin. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologiae, which we often think of Aquinas as dry as dust doctrine. But in the first part of the Summa, when he's discussing God's sovereignty, comes the question, does prayer mean anything? Does it do anything if God is sovereign? And he makes the point, yes it is. Yes it does. Prayer is one of the causes, one of the means by which God achieves his purposes. Prayer, says Spurgeon. I guess there aren't many sermons where Aquinas and Spurgeon are quoted back to back. But Spurgeon says this, agreeing with Aquinas, though probably not realizing it. Prayer is one of the necessary wheels of the machinery of providence. Spurgeon was a great, great one-liner man, wasn't he? Prayer is one of the necessary wheels of the machinery of providence. Prayer is God's appointed means of achieving that which he desires to achieve, supremely in his Son. He's appointed his Son to intercede for his people. Could God not have simply done it by fiat? Probably he could. And yet he has set it up that his son will pray so that he might achieve what he wanted to achieve all along. And our prayers are analogous to that. Paul calls for Christians to be constant in prayer. And if you want to be encouraged, if you want to be encouraged about a whole host of things in the Christian life, look at the things that Paul asks people to pray 
for him about. Sometimes we can think of Paul as, well, he is he's the great apostle, isn't he? Surely Paul had got everything nailed down. Surely Paul was super confident in the way that he witnessed and preached. My experience, your experience, could be nothing like that of Paul. Well, look at some of the things that Paul asked for prayer. He asked for opportunities to proclaim Christ, Colossians 4.3. In the same prayer request, he asks for clarity of speech in proclamation. This is Paul. This is Paul, the one who has a greater grasp, it seems, of New Testament theology than anybody else out there. And yet Paul feels the need to ask his brothers and sisters to pray, that he'd be given opportunities to speak, and when they come along, he will speak clearly. He, pray, he asks, 2 Thessalonians 3.1, he asks that the word might be powerful. This is Paul. You read the encounters in Acts, this is a man who seems to have every answer. And you can tell that because so often they sort of run him out of town. If they had good arguments against him, why would they run him out of town? Paul seems to be a powerful arguer in various venues, and yet he, pray, he asks his brothers and sisters in Christ to pray that the word might be powerful. Paul, of course, is the one who knows that he's already died and risen with Christ, and he will be resurrected at the end of time. He has full confidence of where he's going. He never seems to waver in his knowledge of God's grace towards him. And yet, he prays in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 2 for physical safety. When I read that, I think, you know, Paul was probably scared. Paul was a human being. He didn't relish the thought of being killed by a mob or assassinated by those who would seek to do him ill because he was preaching the gospel. And Paul was scared by that. And he prayed, he asked others to pray that he would be given physical safety. Would Paul's prayer to Christ not have been adequate for that? Well, in a sense, yes. But the body united to Christ, what affects one part affects another. And that spills over into our prayer lives too. The prayers of others can be a means of grace whereby God helps us as individuals and as a church. Paul asks others to pray for him because their prayers will be a means of grace to him. They will be a means of God mercifully ministering to him in a way that allows him to accomplish the purpose God desires him to accomplish. In summary, therefore, what would I leave you with this evening? Well, first of all, I want to encourage you. If you struggle in prayer, one of the great joys of the Christian is knowing that the power of your prayer does not depend upon the power of your prayer. The power of your prayer depends upon the power of Christ's prayer. And Christ is of one being with the Father. And everything that he asks for, the Father will grant. The Heidelberg Catechism, the last question, puts it beautifully when it says, It is more certain that God hears my prayer than I am in my heart that I desire what I pray for. It's a wonderfully, almost paradoxical way of stating it. That it's more certain that God listens to your prayer than that you desire what you pray for. How could the catechist write that? Because he understands the dynamic of prayer is ultimately not simply you and God. The dynamic of prayer is the dynamic between the Father and the Son. Secondly, remember that prayer is one way of reflecting the unity of the body. We think of many ways of reflecting the unity of the body. We learn about Christians in other lands when people are suffering in our congregations. We visit them in hospital. We take the meals. We do acts of kindness for them. Let us not forget that prayer is perhaps the preeminent means, the preeminent means of reflecting the unity of the body. There are churches probably within half a mile or a mile of here that do not belong to either of our denominations where the gospel is faithfully preached, where the Lord Jesus is exalted, where men and women and boys and girls 
come to faith and identify with Christ and his people by faith. Pray for them. They may not be part of your denomination or my denomination or this church, but they're part of the body. Pray for them. Rejoice when they rejoice and mourn when you hear that they are mourning. And remember that the prayers of others are to help us. We all benefit from praying for each other. If you're worried or about something, if you're fearful of speaking the gospel to a co-worker, if you're worried about speaking the gospel to the waitress in the restaurant you regularly visit, if it makes you quake in your boots, and frankly it does me, ask others to pray for you. Pray that your courage will hold. It is no shame to be frightened, but the Lord has given us a means whereby we can be strengthened. The prayers of our brothers and sisters in Christ, taken up by our Savior Christ in heaven and presented to God the Father as that which God the Father desires to grant us anyway. So I hope I've solved the mystery tonight. As I say, I've been perplexed for a long time over how prayer is a means of grace. And the reason was I think I never looked at scriptural teaching on prayer in order to see what God himself has revealed about prayer. Praise God for the intercession of his son and for the intercession of our brothers and sisters in Christ on our behalf.